We're glad that you joined us this morning. Join us as we sing together. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place or walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glorious name. so glad that you are watching live with us on Facebook. Um, I'm so glad you are tuning in. And if you are a guest, uh, we would love to connect with you. And as you'll see in the comment section below, we're going to drop a link to our connect card, which is at mayfieldroad.org slash connect. Fill out that card um, so that we may get some information about you and connect with you. See how we can love on you and serve you you and also members if you have any prayer needs on that connect card as well there is the section for a uh, prayer request please fill that out if there are prayer needs because we would love to come alongside you and pray with you now if you have any critical needs that uh, we may be able to meet please send an email to uh, lee deeds um, and his email is lee at mayfield dot or cannot, and if that's for any critical needs, that is Lee at MayfieldRoad.org. Now, um, as we are continuing this time, please, please, please continue to give. And we thank you for those who um, are continuing to do so. Now, remember, there are three ways to do it. Um, you could do it on our website, which is at MayfieldRoad.org slash giving. Uh, you could do it through your bank and as well in person by dropping it off in the mail slot by the office door. Um, I'm so grateful and so thankful for each and every one of you who are tuning in. Uh, con let's continue to worship and bring praise, glory, and honor to our God who art in heaven. As we continue to worship this morning, what a friend we have in Jesus. He's always there. He'll be ministering to you and your needs. Let's sing together. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry. Everything. 
Good morning. I'm Bobby Bridges. I'm care pastor here at Mayfield Road Baptist Church. And one of the great privileges we have as Christians is to go into the presence of God and share with Him our concerns, our prayers. God listens and He encompasses those prayers in a very special way. And today I invite you where you are to join us in prayer. If you've written something down, uh, that is a prayer concern or you know in your heart that you have a concern join that with the concerns that we have here and as we lift it up God sorts it all out and intervenes in all of those circumstances and with all those needs and so I just want to address that we have uh, two families in our church that have lost loved ones uh, already on this weekend and a number of people who need our prayers because of different issues in their lives and so if you will, just join me now as we pray and go to the Lord, all of us together praying at the same time. Uh, Father God, we, uh, we just come in awe of you that you would want to have conversation with us and that even though you already know every need that we have, everything on our hearts, you want us to come and to bring it to you like a child crawling up in the lap of its dad and, and looking up and saying, this is where I hurt. This is what I need. We thank you that you're so capable and so powerful as to answer all our needs and that you are a wonderful counselor and you come to our hearts to solve our issues. And so just now we lift everything up to you with praise and glory to your name, praying, believing, and thanking you that you're going to answer all these prayer needs and the prayers that we voice through the days of this week. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Yeah. 
pray with me? Our Father, we come now to that which is central in our worship. We come to the time of opening your word, your living word. It is the source above all other sources for our needs, for the complexities around us, for all that disturbs us and even all that pleases us. Your word is that which guides us. And we trust it. So we come now to open your word and we ask that you, through your Holy Spirit, teach and preach to us. Remove me out of the way and just use this to your glory. Teach us and grow us that we might be better after this worship time is over than we were before. That we might be more like you and more like you would have us be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. There's a remarkable story of some of the eastern tribes and how they deal with their major income, and that is as beekeepers. These people have a, a rare approach to tending to beekeeping, and one of the remarkable things is they're hardly ever faced by being stung. It certainly isn't because they are clothed in certain protective gear in order to uh, do their job raiding the beehives. It has nothing to do with clothing at all because actually they wear very little. What it has to do is the passive attitude they have about life. Their deliberation in careful movement and making no sudden efforts to protect themselves. Not attempting to drive the swarm of bees away. And when a bee settles on them, that bee would not try to sting them any more than it would try to sting a log of wood. For most of us, the problem in dealing with bees is like dealing with life. Our problem is that we somehow grow anxious, and perhaps that's out of fear. One of our great presidents said the only thing we have to do or to fear is fear itself, and that's where we are so often. But when we're surrounded by a crowd of angry bees, we begin to swat and to make noises and to move quickly and run in circles and all that does is invite the harmful sting of the bee. There are situations in life that's just like being surrounded by a swarm of angry bees. Let me paint one for you of old. We're going back to about 607 B.C. And to a name that you may know but not know much about, and that's the name of the prophet Habakkuk. Let me share with you how Habakkuk described the storm of bees in his life. It may very well sound familiar. How long, Lord, do I cry for help? And you don't seem to hear. I cry out about all the violence, and yet you don't seem to show up. Somehow I feel like you put me in the place to face iniquity and to see wickedness everywhere. Destruction and violence faces me every day and strife and tension boils up among the people. The law is ignored. Justice is not being upheld. There are wicked people on all sides of me. Justice is perverted. Sound familiar? Like being in a cloud of angry bees. For Habakkuk, 
his personal coming to grips with how God would have him deal with the difficulties of his day was a bit delayed. You might say he was a bit of a slow learner. It took him a while to come around to doing things God's way and being patient. Waiting on the Lord. Being still and knowing that God has not deserted anything but that he is on the scene. And like Habakkuk, sometimes you and I cry out. We feel like we're in the midst of a lot of bees. And sometimes the thing that we think we should do is the very worst thing to do. And that is to pass judgment or to put blame on someone else. And appear to believe that there is no truth to be had. The Philippians were much the same way. The Philippians were encompassed by what would appear to be a cloud of angry bees because they were under Roman rule. And sometimes that could be very gruesome. If you go to the Holy Land today, just over from the old city in Jerusalem, is the place of the skull and the tomb in which Jesus spent three days. The place of the skull is a high side of a mountain in a rock quarry. And when the Romans judged someone just because they were accused, they would take them up to the top of that mountain and shove them off down into the rocks. If they did not die upon impact, they would come down and the Romans would begin to throw stones, hitting the person until they were dead. That place is a very vivid reminder of being encompassed by misery. And the Philippians were. In addition to that, they had to deal with uh, the Jews, many of them their own people. Jews were telling them that they had to become fully Judaized before they could become Christian. And other Jews were telling them that Jesus didn't really have any influence at all. They were surrounded as well by a pagan world that was offering them all kinds of reasons to doubt, to be afraid, and false gods to worship. And so Habakkuk, the Philippians, the church in 2020, we're all surrounded by what appears to be a swarm of angry bees. In Philippians chapter 4, beginning with verse 1, Paul, in his own style, appears to just drop in some ideas about dealing with the circumstances like we face today, like Habakkuk faced of old, and like the Philippians were facing. Listen to what he has to say. It's a little bit odd. It goes against the grain. It goes against our nature like being passive in the storm of bees. Rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice, I say again. Let your ability to take life, your forbearing spirit, be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Such simple things. Things that you and I could easily do. The first thing he says is to be joyful. That's the theme of his book. To the Philippians in the swarm of bees in which they found themselves. He, he said be joyful. Rejoice. And rejoice all the time. Keep on rejoicing. Never stop rejoicing. And here's the secret of rejoicing. It is an act of faith. Because if you don't have something to believe in. 
you don't have any reason to be happy. So the first thing that you and I must do is believe in God and the power of God on the scene of the swarms of bees around us. And as we do, we can find the secret of being joyful in the midst of threat and challenge and disbelief and even war and destruction. The second thing that Paul touches on here is patience. I'll have to admit to you, this week I sort of tried the bee story in my own yard. I was working in the yard and I had to trim uh, around a flower bed and I realized that I was near uh, a hornet's underground nest and they had dug up the dirt and they were swarming around the yard. Big hornets, I mean the two inch deals. And I was wondering, how in the world am I going to do this? But it's got to be done. After all, my wife was watching, and, and uh, uh, she was waiting on that perfective move there to get that done. So uh, as I got down, I thought, okay, I'm going to act like I'm one of those Eastern tribal leaders, and I'm going to be very slow and deliberate and careful. And I must admit to you that having patience in those moments wasn't easy. But the secret is, it worked. And as I just slowly moved and cut the growth around that area and moved away, I didn't suffer a sting. Patience. It's a virtue. Prayer is another thing that Paul talks about, and he talks about that with long-suffering. That is, being very gentle in our praying and in our approach. Faith, patience, prayer, and long-suffering are the basis. And it it is if Paul just sort of pulls these things together and and packages them up and puts a bow on top and, and says to the Philippians, if you want to know how to Stay joyful. You have to believe in God, the basis of your joy. And then you have to be patient. And then you need to be in touch with God in prayer. And you need to be gentle. Some people may ask you, well, I'm not sure that has a reason to work. I don't know that it can work. But Paul not only suggested these things, in addition to making the suggestions, he had lived them out. The Philippians had seen Paul do the very things he suggested, for instance. In another situation in the same town in Philippi, Paul and Silas were jailed. They had been severely beaten. Blood was streaming down their backs. And they began to disrupt the quietness of the jail at midnight by praying aloud and singing. They were praising God in the midst of such a horrible setting. So Paul could say to the Philippians, rejoice always with the living proof that he knew what he was talking about. In our text, in another setting, Paul is again in jail, but he is chained by the hand to the hand of a Roman guard. They could not get away from each other. It was a miserable thing. It was at times embarrassing. It was coupled with the fact that death was hanging over Paul's head. And in the midst of that, Paul says, rejoice. Be happy. Be joyful. And he doesn't just say rejoice. He says rejoice always. Dr. Jimmy Draper, who is a good friend of mine, who was the former pastor of First Baptist Church, Eulis, here in our Metroplex, and president of the Southern Baptist Convention, and later president of Lifeway Christian Resources, 
said, there are no circumstances in which we cannot rejoice in the Lord. Nothing. No circumstances in which we cannot rejoice in the Lord. And I have a book. It's probably my favorite book in my library. It's uh, written by Leslie Flynn, and it's an old book. The title of it, Your Influence is Showing. In other words, when Paul was in jail and responding the way he did, people saw it. It put power into his suggestion to rejoice in the Lord. And you and I are called to demonstrate our faith in such a way that those around us would observe and see that while this is not the natural thing to do, it is the winning thing to do. Philippians 3, 1 says, The one in whom joy thrives has a safeguard for their very lives. I read this quote, I'll share it with you. Christian character is the acquired ability to put up with things that are wrong, inflicted upon you by another person, without approving of it, but without as well breaking the relationship. You, you might say that circumstances should not create victims out of us, but rather we should be victorious amidst all the circumstances. Let your forbearing spirit be on display before every man. That fifth verse is so interesting to me because it says, in effect, what I've just been saying. Your influence is showing. People are watching. The cell phones are recording. And you must be aware that at all times, in a sense, you're on stage living the very principles and character of Jesus Christ in our world. Forsake not the pleasures that you calculate in life if those pleasures bring harm to someone else. Give up your preferences if in doing so, you can help someone else. And in the love chapter, Paul reminds us that if you truly love and are obsessed with love and share love, you will not be one to go about seeking your own way. Now, in that fifth verse, there's a, a, a secret let your forbearing spirit be known to all men. Put it on display. Let everyone see it. Because the Lord is near. His imminence means that he could walk into this very room before we move out of here in just a few minutes. He could be with you on the street. Whatever you may be doing at any moment. James 5, 9 rephrases that idea by saying that the judge is at the door. And for us, this means that, that we're not only living our faith and doing the right thing before others, but we're in the presence of the living God. And that puts a whole different demand on it. Though we walk in this flesh, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 says, we do not war according to the flesh. We don't get our bats and go to war and take our guns and shoot each other like the world does. We go peacefully with our intention of doing good. And in so doing, we change our world. Rejoice in the Lord always. Make a gentle response visible to everyone, understanding that you're in the very presence of God. 
who may come for you at any moment. But as well come for you is the power to help you when you are surrounded with a cloud of angry bees. Rainey said, said it this way, the way to be anxious about nothing is to be prayerful about everything. And so we move to verse 6. Be anxious for nothing but in everything, by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, make your request known to God. Who else would you talk to? Who else could bring a solution to the circumstances in which we find ourselves? It doesn't seem the politicians know what to do. It doesn't seem that groups of people with different ideologies know what to do. The street warfare certainly hasn't settled anything. So often there is no place to turn except to all the power in the universe. Almighty God. And he goes on to say something even more important here. The peace that God brings to you while surpassing the comprehension of everyone will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. God literally encompasses us and guards us with his peace. Isaiah 26, 3 points out God will keep us in perfect peace while we trust him. The Greek meaning in the words here in this verse, verse 7, basically means this. There is a heavenly sentinel who will forever meet every challenge that approaches you and solve the worries of your mind and the disturbances of your heart. God is ready to help us. So I entitled the message today, God's Peace is on Duty. If you don't remember anything else, remember that. God's peace is on duty in your very life. Now, amidst all of the suggestions of what we should do with this day and this time in which we live, this is God's truth. God's truth always, always works. Rejoice in the Lord always and again. I say rejoice. Pray with me. Father, in these moments, we just come to you with praises because no one else that we know deserves praise like you. We bow in your presence with heavy hearts for so many reasons and so many people around us. We hurt and we see people making terrible mistakes. We feel they will regret later. And Father, we just bring them to you. And we ask you to move in the mighty power of your spirit in the lives of people that so desperately need guidance above and beyond anything this world offers who are surrounded by a cloud of angry bees help them to be gentle and forbearing and kind help them to praise and to pray and to be what you want them to be help me to do those things We know that your word is truth. We thank you for preserving it for us on this Sunday morning. We pray that you will give us the ability to put it to practice. 
for again it is your truth and your truth works in Jesus name I pray amen thank you for joining us this morning we pray that you have a blessed day let's sing together this is the day this is the day that the Lord has We hope you have a great day. Thank you for joining us.